an issue. Um, so yeah, David's advocacy, I think, would be very much rebuild the informal economy as much as possible so that when the market economy fails, we've got something to fall back on. Yeah, which is very testing and difficult because I, I'm not sure if, if one was looking at this completely dispassionately, I'm not sure we have a faster rate of community uh, politics, the growth of community initiatives, the upsurge in people doing things for themselves that they might once have looked to the market economy to do. I'm not sure that is moving faster in our society today than it might have moved at, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. It's very difficult to put your finger on that. And what that means is that a lot of that community uprising, if you like, is quite fragile. Um, it's not it's not, if you like, resilient enough in David's terms to secure its continuity at times of great difficulty. And we have such a churn in society anyway with people moving much more. The mobility factor actually militates against some of that continuity and relationship that you get in communities. Upside to that, a downside to that, because it can work against the diversity that we'd like to encourage. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but on the other hand, I'm very upbeat about something that David didn't have a chance to reflect on. Um, Sean and I might disagree on this, um, with a strong transition town background and me more of a um, huge sympathy for transition towns. David was a great uh, peak oil theorist. I mean, he subscribed to the view that we were going to run out of oil. And at the point at which we ran out of oil, or at least oil, the availability of oil meant that the price would rise so that essentially our economies would not be able to cope because they could no longer depend on relatively cheap oil. Um, and to a certain extent, that actually became far too big a part of his thinking about this, this descent path. A lot of his theory behind collapse was to do with the non-availability of relatively cheap fossil fuels. Actually, we're in a completely different world now. We're never going to run out of fossil fuels. There's just massive amounts of fossil fuels available to us. I mean, just unbelievable volumes of fossil fuels in terms of unconventional <coughs> oil and gas and, and all the rest of it. I was just reading up about the latest protests going on now in Nevada just on the boundary between North and South Nevada. This is essentially a first American Indian uprising against the fossil fuel industry because they've just identified in Nevada, not far from the Bakken Shale, huge, this huge reservoir of new gas primarily, but some oil as well. And this isn't, this isn't a question of us running out of this stuff. And I say that now much more categorically <coughs> than I would when I was arguing with David. And what he's missed out on is the absolutely astonishing transformative power of solar. And I think that that might have cheered him up a little bit, because actually the solar revolution is staggering to watch what is going on all around the world. We're moving out of the period of burning things in order to produce the energy we need into direct substitution of incoming solar radiation to create the energy that we need. We can't move away completely from burning things at the moment, whether it's wood or cow dung or oil or gas or whatever it might be, or even uranium. We, it's too early to say that we can put all that, that process of burning our way to prosperity behind us. But actually, you can right now see a world, even of 9 billion people, that would be able to provide for its modest needs, very important word to slip in there, its modest needs, without access to any fossil fuels at all, within the course of the next two to three decades. That world is already visible. I can already see that emerging in our midst. The speed of change on these technologies is staggering, absolutely staggering. So we're not going to descend into collapse because we run out of oil. That is just not going to happen. We are still likely to descend into collapse because we put so much of the byproduct of burning fossil fuels into the atmosphere, the CO2 and the other greenhouse gases. That's still, that's still quite likely, to be honest. But there's no descent scenario any longer based on running out of fossil fuels. And we don't need to panic about that because, frankly, the, the absolute uptick in renewables now, particularly solar, is extraordinary to watch. 
And then for poorer countries around the world, this is not just a good thing and timely. This is revolutionary. This is creating economic opportunities for people. It's creating a sense of more dignified lives, better futures for people that was not, couldn't be envisioned if in your mind you thought that it was always going to be fossil fuels that had to do the heavy lifting on energy. And actually that's one of the most important things going on in our world today, which is why I'm putting it slightly confrontationally, because there are still more than a handful of peak oilists out there who actually think that's a bigger thing than the um, incredibly explosive growth in solar-based technologies. I mean, to, to address that, I mean, I, I broadly agree with you. I mean, what frustrates <coughs> me is people who look at climate change in isolation or look at peak oil in isolation. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're two sides of the same issue. Um, I would say that, yeah, it's madness when people talk about people without reference to climate change, absolutely. Um, I also think that it's madness to say that peak oil is, is blown out of the water because I think things like fracking would not be happening if not for the depletion of the much sweeter oils, the much more accessible, the much cheaper, the much less polluting energy sources that we were previously relying on. And if you look at peak oil and climate change together, then peak oil makes our climate change challenge much more challenging because it's leading us to these, these sort of these sort of dirty fuels. Um, I'm, yeah, I have to say I'm, I'm wary of the idea that that we can just the idea that we can just carry on roughly as we are on renewables. I think is a very dangerous yeah. idea. Um, I, think, I think we need to flag that up every time we talk about it. I, yeah. I, I don't think we can run a, a consumerist capitalist economy on renewables. We energy. can't. <laughs> um, but uh, but given that it's what we've got, <laughs> um, I mean... Uh, but we can run a good economy. Yeah. And I think that's the, this whole question is, what is our level of expectation for good lives for 9, 10 billion people? That's the nub of this. And, and, and I think that's, again, where the strength of David's ideas kicks in, because he's clearly not talking of a, of a world of sackcloth and ashes, you know, with everybody subsisting in a state of near bloody misery. Um, because you can only eat meat once a month, and you know, you just you know, it's just going to be utterly hellish to live in this kind of way. David would n would never have subscribed to that kind of imposed misery in the name of sustainability. Yep, we want humankind to survive, so you're all going to have an absolutely bloody miserable time from here <coughs> to the end of time. And that's the price we have to pay, that's the sacrifice we have to make in order to guarantee survival for humankind. I, I don't think, you never, I don't, no. you know, I don't think no, you ever, not ever so. I mean, as, as, you, as you pull out in your forward, he describes green authoritarianism as, as a guarantee of failure. Yeah. Um, you know, if we try and impose this kind of vision, it's, yeah. well, it's not desirable and it won't work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anyway, we've been very unhappy without his bottle occasional bottle of very good red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we've got, got one, two, three, so we'll take them in that order. Maybe we'll hear them all and then we'll see. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so I wanted to, to kind of come back to the this question of sort of place and you talked about the idea of sort of we um, and you talked about Scottish independence a couple of times and something that really struck me about that as an English person who lived in Scotland sort of twelve years ago but went back for the period over the referendum was you know what an inclusive version of we that was and the way that people who'd mm. been living in the country for three months you know were voting for example compared to the kind of we mm. that was getting spoken about in the brexit referendum and i i absolutely take your point about the polarization of kind of everybody who voted for brexit was this sort of racist you know idiot but i do i i, I, was, I don't know if other people saw there was a a poll that happened after the vote where they really mapped people, the, the general uh, trend was that people who voted Brexit also were people who believed that the environmental movement had been harmful, that feminism had been uh, destructive of you know social tradition. It, it sort of mapped onto a lot of other attitudes. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm just, I, I don't know what, what your take, what Xavier Fleming's take was on on the sort of stories we tell, basically, about mm. about who we are and, and kind of where that comes from mm. and what kind of hope we can have about um, making that, yeah, a more, a more liberal one, basically. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm quite interested in this idea of 
of um, of tipping points, and I, I'm not in prediction them because, because that's that's folly. But uh, of, of, uh, and share your sense of this kind of optimism and the solar surge, renewable surge on one side, but also the climate and all the other planetary boundaries that we're crossing or have crossed rapidly. Um, and I, my sense as a young person trying to find something to, to believe in is that there's kind of a, almost this race between these tipping points, mm. and it's it's still perhaps an open question about which we reach first. You know, do we do, do does solar become cheap enough? Etc. Etc. Mm. Quite before we are locking ourselves into five degrees or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's just a reflection on how I kind of view those things coming together. And I'm really interested in making space for community groups. I'm involved with Transition Network in the UK, and and I don't think my answer just from that transition lens is I don't think the growth of community groups and, and new activity is is, is enough. Uh, certainly to counter all the negative things that are happening. Mm -hmm. But I'm really interested in how we make space for those things to happen, um, to kind of carve out a kind of almost a protected bubble in our communities or in our lives where the market doesn't reach, or, you know, creating a kind of Eden Project style dome so we can grow some of these alternatives uh, within the kind of very oppressive uh, mm -hmm. society we live in. And that, that'd be something I'm just interested to hear thoughts about. Um, thank you. It's a really um, fascinating event. Lots I could ask about, but I think um, I just want to pick up on a comment. That, um, I think, Jonathan, you mentioned, I don't know if it's your comment or, or David Fleming's, but you said um, we're not very good at ha ha handling collapse scenarios. And it's like, no, I totally agree. On, on our own, we're not, but neither are we good at not handling collapse scenarios. And I, think <laughs> I see a lot of kind of, I guess what I'm thinking of, God, there's a lot of pre-traumatic stress disorder going on that comes out in really wonky ways when we're thinking about the future because it's pretty hard to sustain that gaze. So mm. I'm curious, um, this is for me, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about as well at the moment, in kind of, yeah, the role of grief and those processes yeah. and the, that, you know, how, how do we kind of create that space for the not knowing, for, you know, allowing the collapse within ourselves to say, yeah, I don't want to go there on my own. But actually, I know from experience, it's incredibly transformative to go there with other people and to have those spaces held. So it's kind of, yeah, how, how do we hold the not knowing and those processes of grief? Because I think there, there is this kind of whole discourse of hope which completely steamrolls over the really uncomfortable stuff. And it's like, it's not saying that we have to go out and try and engage everyone with the uncomfortable stuff. Um, but I think it's how do we make that space? So. <laughs> okay, great. I think we'll end that round, and but we'll have time for another. So keep those hands. Um, um, okay. Well, uh, I yeah, the we, the we is really oh, the we is really interesting, and um, I'm I'm certainly one of those who believes that we lost the referendum because we or we that may be, did not articulate exactly what the we would be for the UK in, with a continued relationship in the EU. And we didn't do that because we, none of the kind of people who were leading the campaign in the Stronger Inn wanted to do that. They did not want to say, for instance, it's bloody brilliant that we're able to pool sovereignty and work together to address global issues. It's brilliant. This is not a sign of us losing control. This is a sign of us gaining control in a troubled world by working with other people to bring forward ideas and solutions that you couldn't possibly do in any version of the UK, in, out, or halfway in between, which is depending on what Brexit means. Um, we didn't articulate that particularly from an English point of view. And I'm fascinated that you drew a distinction between the way in which in the Scottish referendum, the we seemed to be, could be interpreted much more inclusively and much more progressively. And yet the voices who were talking about we in England in the referendum campaign did seem to go towards some quite illiberal, oppressive, anti-progressive um, ideas. And I, just as we don't want to, we don't want to characterize every Brexit voter as being either stupid or right-wing, we sure as hell want to acknowledge that an awful lot of people who did vote out 
subscribe to values and ideas about other human beings that are abhorrent for me. Abhorrent because they're often xenophobic. They're absolutely based on identifying and then castigating the other and all the rest of it. But we didn't try. Uh, no, this is awful because I just, I was so involved in this wretched campaign and spent such a lot of time with a group of young people called We Are Europe trying to fashion a positive voice about why being in Europe was just the most amazing thing. And God, you mean we're only handing away 350 million pounds a week? That's such a bargain. I mean, really, you know, we should be thinking about upping that because think about everything we're going to get and all this kind of stuff. And none of that worked. I mean, none of it worked because the campaign, the Stronger In campaign, just could only play one card, the fear card about, about what would happen to our wretched growth economy if we voted out. It, the, it, when, when the history of this stuff is written, I think people will be completely astonished that those who cared most about Europe chose to fight on that territory. I just think people will look in disbelief and say, how did you think that was going to really work? So for me, the we thing now is really critical because we can't ignore rethinking what it means to find ourselves now with not much sense of who the we is in England. There's a much more sense of we in Scotland and a we in Wales and even to, uh, certainly in Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, but even in Northern Ireland, there's more of a sense of we. We, we don't do that. We don't know quite how to do that. Really. And we're very nervous because as soon as you start thinking, what we really need is an English parliament. And then you think, oh God, oh God, what have I just said? Am I, am I streaming Farage? Have I just suddenly <laughs> fallen into a dreadful time warp so that I'm just, I'm a kind of proto ukipper posturing as a green. Um, um, we're, so, we're so scared about the fact that UKIP got some things right about identity and about community and about how we need to live together. But we don't know, we're just, we're just so buttoned up, we can't talk about this <laughs> stuff. So I'm now trying to work out what a progressive we looks like, to begin with, for England, because you, know, you can talk about the UK to your heart's content, you can talk about Britain and all the rest of it. Honestly, if we don't sort of sort something out for England, probably lots of stuff about UK it isn't really gonna work for many people who live in England, uh, particularly people who don't live in London. Because that's the other thing about you know, what happened in the in the referendum. Um, I mean, maybe I'll speak to the we Yeah, no, um, Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's really interesting that you say that because I know people who voted out because they wanted to throw a spanner in the works of the growth economy, um, and they saw this as being, do you want more of this or not? And so they thought, no, we yeah. don't. Um, and, um, I mean, for me, I, I said it wasn't clear to me which way I would vote, and that's because, for me, I see the current way that border controls are managed as being inherently racist and morally indefensible. I don't see any reason why where you're born should determine where you're allowed to live, fundamentally. At the same time, on the other hand, well, I'll read you a bit from David. Um, and so he drew a lot on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, um, the late Nobel prize-winning economist, uh, who did a huge amount of work on the commons and the importance of the commons. Um, and I'm increasingly interested in this because it seems to me that if the left is obsessed with the state and the right is obsessed with the markets and corporations, I'm not really on board with either of those. Um, and this idea of community and commons seems to me to be um, a lot more interesting. So David, drawing on Eleanor Ostrom, says that closed access is a necessary condition for the management of a commons. With limited numbers of people within its boundaries, the demands made on it too are limited, making them realistic and sustainable. The members of any managed commons must undertake to comply with the rules necessary for its maintenance. It follows that they must exclude others who do not comply with those rules, or whose demands would exceed the limits of what it can supply. The principle underlying this is known as subtractivity or rivalness, the idea that what one person harvests from a resource subtracts from the ability of others to do the same. There is a simple recognition here of the objective reality of the resource. It has its limits, and no amount of technical trickery or emotional pleading can make that fact go away. Recognising subjectivity is a case of growing up, as in realising <coughs> that the powers of your parents to provide are not unlimited. Moving on from the child think of unqualified confidence that the political economy you live in can provide. 
The alternative is the tragedy of the commons, and he, he writes a lot about the tragedy of the commons and how, in fact, it's the tragedy of the marketplace of commons, because historically all commons were made up of people who knew each other and, and talked to each other, and if someone started exploiting it, they'd quickly be told off or run out of town. Um, only in a market where everyone's atomized does the tragedy of the commons even, even come into existence. Um, but this is the case of the destruction of a common resource as individuals make ever greater demands on it, benefiting from what they can get individually, but not seeing as their problem the damage done by those ever greater demands to the commons as a whole. In a society used to cheap travel, and to the idea that destruction, when it comes to boundaries and the rhetoric about tearing down barriers, is a good thing, the idea of closed access at first invites unease. There is a sense both of being locked in and of unfairly locking out. But in fact, it works the other way. Almost wherever you go in the market economy, you find yourself in the same place. In the globalised market, with its shared banality, its fullness, at the end of every lane is a busy road and a housing estate like the one at the beginning of it. You cannot get out of a globalised world because there is no out. Closed access does not mean closed in. It means the protection of distinctiveness. When you are out, you are somewhere else, in a different inn. And so this, for me, has been really interesting because I got so frustrated with the level of debate around Brexit and it's just been like, well, you're a racist, well, you're an idiot. And like, so for me, there's a real difficult tension here to deal with between the fact that I see border controls as they currently are as just completely indefensible and the fact that there is a need to limit movement in some way. And what I find really inspiring about David's work is that his idea of limiting movement is to make people love the place that they're in. Mm. So you're not saying you can't come here. You're, you're helping people to say, well, why would I want to leave this place that I love? Um, and in my experience, you know, most of the people who are leaving somewhere, it's not because they don't like being where their family and their community is. It's because of war or because of the increasing effects of climate change or because of... And so, you know, this... this this approach seems to me to make sense, and the, the, the level of problem that we have now is again a product of this, this neoliberal market-based economy which is increasingly destroying the communities of places and the sustainability of places so that people have to leave and go somewhere else and thus potentially overwhelm that other place. But at the same time, we shouldn't get caught up in our opposition to border xenophobia and forget that there are limits to growth, you know, that actually places can't take an infinite influx, even though yeah. we might wish that they could. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I mean, we probably don't have time to go into it in huge depth now. Just a quick word on pre-traumatic pre stress disorder, if mm. I may, before we take the next one. Oh, yeah, no, um, I'm going to come to the other Oh, sorry, oh, I see, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were about to no, no, move no, on. No, no, we've got plenty more to say. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, just that, that, that um, I think those on both sides of the Brexit name-calling need to recognise that there's, regardless, maybe the individual person you're talking to is an idiot or a racist, as Jonathan said, but nonetheless, there is a difficult discussion that we need to have here, and if we just shout slogans from either side, we're not happy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, tipping points and pre-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I, do, I, I entirely ag agree with you about the need to find a way of sharing some of those concerns. And actually, funny enough, that is one of the reasons why Dark Mountain came about, was because they got so cross about this enforced optimism in, the, in some parts of the greening movement, the greening world, that was even confronting this possibility that it's sort of taboo almost. And, and, I, and I can see that, it, but it's the way in which we do it that I think is so important. And I've, and I've, just, I've actually just spent the weekend with a group of people um, thinking through this notion about how we address this. And one of the things that we were looking at was an extraordinary new book. Um, that's after you've read these two, okay? So <laughs> just, <coughs> just want to make that absolutely clear. <laughs> Once you've read these two. Um, a, a book called The Moth Snowstorm by Mike McCarthy. And Mike used to be the editor, the environment editor um, on The Independent. And The Moth Snowstorm refers to this thing that some of, some of you may remember, older ones will remember, that when long before the days of intensive agriculture and you were driving through the night, you would find that you had to stop every now and then to clear your windscreen of the hundreds of bugs and insects and moths that had died um, as, they, as they flew towards the lights of the car. And, and, and I can remember this. That's the, that's, I'm just explaining why the, this book has got such an odd title. 
Um, but the book is incredible because it says that one of the ways we can confront this notion of potential despair without giving into it is to simultaneously celebrate the joy that exists in our relationships with each other and with the natural world. And, and this is a, a sort of intense version of conviviality, if you like, is recognizing, seeking out opportunities where people can be joyful together in the natural world or in each other's company at the community level, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and Mike writes just so beautifully about how nature becomes this source of meaning for us as we seek to develop these alternative ideas. And it is funny, I mean, I don't, I'm not being critical about David, he's, he's not great on the natural world, okay? I mean, I, it, it's a, I'm, this is really an odd thing to say, but it's true, quite a lot of people who come at sustainability thinking more from a sociological and economic point of view, there's a sort of slightly constrained uh, sense of David in the natural world. I mean, he was much happier in his, in his sort of flat sitting looking out over Hampstead Heath than he sometimes was in Hampstead Heath, if I can put it like that. Um, and there's, there's none of the lyricism that you might, ex very little of the lyricism about the natural world that you might expect from an author with David's capacity for lyricism, which is e extraordinary, to be honest. There's not much of it relates to the natural world. Mike McCarthy says, we have got to get good again at capturing that sense of this deep bond that we have with the natural world and find opportunities, to find them actively. Don't just think it's going to happen by chance. I mean, I'm just sitting here staring over your heads at this unbelievable copper beach that is in the, I don't know if it's still Trinity College over there or some other college, exactly, whichever college it may be. And I'm, I am very sort of quietly and probably imperceptibly to all of you just feeling really good about that. Just really good. And David's sense of community is sometimes a little bit denatured. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking about why our more healthy, vibrant communities would actually be more healthy and vibrant because they were celebrating nature at every turn. So I'm, for me, there's a sort of story about nature in this, in this uh, world of culture that is just a little bit attenuated in but Mike McCarthy's book is just, it's just so amazing, and I, I, I unhesitatingly recommend it, as long as you've got the sequencing right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I think that is fair. I mean, I love, there's an entry, Encounter, in there, where he writes about um, encountering a little deer in the woods, mm. and what a transformative experience it can be, and how different it would be if that little deer were some sort of android that you created yourself and programmed and set to run out there, but then there would be no sense of the other. And no sense of encounter there, but encountering that little deer. In God, don't tell me he prefigured Pokemon Go. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> okay, this is worrying. <laughs> Beach tree isn't doing it any longer, sorry. <laughs> and of course, this is a pre invention of Wikipedia, this book in itself. Well, that's true. But, uh, yeah, that true. Um, but yeah, you're right, actually. Um, it's interesting because, I mean, one, of the, one guy who absolutely does do that is Stephen Harding at Schumacher College, mm. who's a great advocate of encounter. And in his um, sort of praise of this book, um, he says that to read this book is to gain a superb education in ecology from one of the greatest masters in the field. But you're right, it's a sort of... Um, David thought about nature probably mm. more than he, he encountered yeah. it, despite yeah. his advocacy from an intellectual point of view of encounter. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah on, the, on, the, on the grief thing, I mean, I was quite involved with the sort of creation of Dark Mountain as a... As a <laughs> like I always get told off if I call it a movie. Um, and, um, uh, and I think you're right. I mean, um, I'm sure you're aware Joanna Macy has done some incredible work around grief and the idea that it's an incredible drain on us if we are feeling despair and not expressing it. Like the, the, the pushing down of that all the time is just exhausting and that we're terrified of breaking, you know, of breaking down, of breaking up. Um, but that actually, and I've been doing a lot of writing about grief myself recently, um, that actually the thing that you find, I mean, in, in the aftermath of, of David Fleming's very sudden death in late 2010, uh, my fiancé passed away just three weeks later very suddenly as well, so I had a, a good um, grounding in grief, and um, that's something which, as I've explored it and come to find my relationship with that, I've 
been writing about it as a writer, and I found that that, that experience of personal grief relates very much to a shared experience of communal grief at what's, what's happening in the natural world. Um, and the sense that, you know, when, you, when, when grief takes you, it just takes all of you, and you, you don't have any choice in that. Um, and you feel like it's going to end you, you feel like it's just unbearable and overwhelming. But eventually, it doesn't end you, and eventually you wake up one day, and instead of 100% of your energy being committed to grief, you find that 99% of your energy is committed to grief, and you sort of want it to be 100% again, because you, you feel like that's what you are right now, but you can't, because just as you can't say no to grief, you can't say, I want more of it either, it just is what it is, and it does do what it does. And so then I sort of woke up one day with this 1% of me that was like, well, I now want to do something as well as grieving. <laughs> Um, and I had, a, I had a friend who said something wonderful to me, he said the best way that you can honour those you love after they die is to keep alive what was best in them in the world through your own life. Um, and obviously these books were the obvious way of doing that for David, um, and there have been ways for Mario as well. And, um, and yeah, just that experience of waking up, allowing yourself to shatter is <laughs> but at the same time, there's a somehow after it, there's another space which is better than before it, um, where that energy that you've been pushing it all down with is somehow released to allow you to tell a story with your life that you want to tell in that new context, in which you can do wholeheartedly because your heart is now sort of whole again through that shattering process somehow. Um, so yeah, I think, I think grief is essential and critical. And, um, and yeah part of nurturing the future that we want to see regardless of whether that's in the context of collapse or not. I mean, so, so much of it comes back to me, to, to this thing of it, it, it really doesn't matter. We can spend all our time arguing about do we predict this or predict that, but actually there are so many things to do that make sense in both contexts that, and, and sort of grief work is one of them. Mm. Um, oh, the, there was a question, I think the other one was around informal economy, I just wanted to mention briefly that, um, so my, my best friend is a guy called Mark Boyle, who's known widely as the moneyless man, um, and uh, he sort of took this notion of, of the gift economy, the informal economy, and retreating from the market economy to the extreme, and lived for three years without any money near Bristol, which is a whole story in itself, which maybe someone could talk to me afterwards about if they want to, um, but he's now working in Ireland to set up a, a moneyless community. Um, as a sort of bubble that people can come to and experience what it is to live completely outside the market economy. Um, and uh, he's recently set up, it being Ireland, a moneyless pub, um, <laughs> which is uh, you know, based on, on homebrew and um, is a wonderfully hospitable place. I was there about a month ago. Um, so I think, um, I think that, uh, yeah, this work to, um, to create these, these bubbles is incredibly important, whether people want to live there Sort of permanently, or whether they just want to come in and sample what it is. I mean, I remember when I first visited Mark on the farm he was living on several years ago, um, and spent, I think, a fortnight there, and then came away from there thinking, well, that was a wonderful time, and then went to the train station and suddenly realised, ugh, I have to spend money to get on the train. <laughs> and it was amazing how quickly that just started to feel unnatural mm. when I was just in a, in a community that was based on a different, on a different premise. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, if you want to hear some other examples, I can certainly give you some afterwards. Um, but uh, I think his story is quite an interesting thread in all of this. So, uh, are we going for time? Yeah, so let's hear a couple more topics. I think there were a couple of people who had their hands up earlier. So maybe take one, two, one, two, great. Um, I, I met David when, when he came out and gave talks in, on Zero Carbon Britain, uh, Centre for Alternative Technology. Um, and the thing to me, I, this is a bit of a cheeky question really, but I'd really like to hear the answer, is, is that he struck me in equal measure as, as, as an inspiring person, but also an absolutely delightful human being. Um, and so when I bumped into him on the train and had a couple of hours to speak to him, I thought, wow, fantastic opportunity. Um, and he was, he was absolutely delightful. And you know him better than anybody else, presumably. So I was wondering if you could give us a couple of, maybe one each an anecdote or a story from his life just to, because there are people like Ed who had never met him or, or heard him before and, and he really was quite a remarkable human being and that would be a delight to me. Um, yeah, thank you very much for an interesting morning. Um, 
I just picked up a couple of things, well, three things really. The first is really to do with this idea of what, what does it, you have to take a point of view which allows for collapse and not a collapse. So to do that, you really have to say what is true. You have to find that, what is, what is real, what's going on, really, um, so that it, it transcends, it's, it's something which overrides both points of view, mm -hmm. that you can take two, two opposing points of view into, into account. And then you think, well, what's identity? You then have to do with what's good, who am I, what am I doing? Um, personally, I feel I'm a global citizen, um, and uh, I, you know, I, I think that Europe is a, an inclusive um, subset of, a glo of, the, of the global world, which is why I was very much in favour of um, remaining in. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, someone said yesterday, "Are you kiss like a European?" Didn't <laughs> 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 quite that. No, I don't feel. I don't feel. I feel much more European than I do English, and I feel much more global and I do European actually. And I think then the question really goes moves on to uh, how technology, you know, we've talked about solar mm. solar revolution, <coughs> but how technology and the ability to connect up with people who share that common identity across the world. And uh, how what take part that place has mm. part that has to play. Oh, what was the key word of that? Um, I would say uh, sort of cyber community. I'd say oh, cyber right. community. So you're you're really talking across boundaries, across borders, uh, to people who share a common identity or a sense of identity mm -hmm. um, and perspective. Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I'm sorry. Probably squeeze in more. It's a bit related to this point, but mm. um, it seems to me that. You know, we have these issues of like um, remain or leave. And everything has um, a duality seems to be an issue. You know, for example, we couldn't have heard, say what percentage are you for Europe? Yeah. Yeah. You know, if we could have voted in that way to embrace our you know ambivalence about a lot of these issues. You know, I think society's um, conditioned towards black or white, yes or no, mm -hmm. and if we can just in that way, and then maybe we can sort of move in that direction more easily. I saw mm -hmm. a wonderful Brexit meme on, on, the, on the cyber community um, just before the vote. Someone was circulating an alternative um, polling paper, and it, had, it sort of had it in at the top and out, and then um, out, but Nigel Farage is a despicable racist, <laughs> in, but don't think I've got anything to do with that Cameron guy, you know, <laughs> it was just, you know, this long list of new, more nuanced approaches. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, do you want to speak to this? I mean, on the, I mean, I think I'll come to the anecdotes <laughs> last, probably. Um, but on truth, um, this gives me an excuse to, to read one of my favourite bits of um, Lean Logic, which is about the nature of truth when he's talking about religion, um, which is something David had a... Actually, David really changed my thinking on religion. Um, so... Um, David asserts that religions are narrative truths affirmed by ritual. They variously assert the existence of many gods, one god, a mystical union of three gods in one, or their myth does not have a concept of god at all. The narrative truth and the ritual in which it is affirmed have essential functions for a community, for the individuals within it, and for its social capital. They embrace its culture, giving it identity and meaning. And although narrative truth is central to it, religion inhabits five different forms of truth. Um, and he talks, actually, I'll pull out my version in here because it's a bit shorter. Um, <coughs> yeah, this was the great achievement of this, I think, was bringing together the I concepts like that segue. of David Fleming and concise. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, material truth is direct, plain, literal description of reality. There is no interest here in exploring deeper implications, insights, and echo meanings. This is the truth which tells you about the route taken by the hot water pipe from the boiler to the bathroom, how to make flatbread, how to photograph otters, what Darwinism is, why a herd of cow's milk yield is higher if the cows are named as well as numbered, what a well-tempered scale is, what a Higgs boson probably is, why pregnant women don't topple over, whether you went to the pub last night. 
Accuracy is not essential. It does not have to be true to belong in the domain of material truth. But it does have to be the speaker's intention that the other person should understand it to be true. The intention is to provide a truthful and uncluttered description. Here facts matter. For religion, there is material truth in its historical account and in at least some of religion's practical and ethical teachings. Narrative truth, or poetic truth, is the truth present not just in storytelling, but in myth, art, and the whole of our culture. This is the truth of pride and prejudice. It is not materially true in that it is fiction. On the other hand, it is true to life. It is as accurate an insight into human character as we have. Elizabeth Bennet's story can neither be dismissed as untrue nor accepted as true. It is in the middle ground. It may or may not report the material truth, but the narrative says something that cannot be said in any other way. It has a shadow meaning that extends beyond metaphor and can lead to the discovery of material or implicit truths, as an explorer in search of the Holy Grail may discover and map real mountains and rivers. Narrative truth makes sense of the roots of our word belief, which comes to our literal-minded age from a story-rich antiquity. It can be traced to the ancient Germanic root glaugian, to hold dear. The Latin for to believe is credere, which comes from quodare, to give one's heart. Narrative truth may be a parable with a clear message, or a story for the story's sake, or the meaning may be forever unknown, a question to be reflected on, perhaps the subject of a lifetime's exploration. It is the domain of poetry, music, and laughter. If you ask whether it is materially true, you are at the wrong party. And yet, our culture regularly lacks the mature judgment necessary to distinguish between material and narrative truth. A work of art makes the question of whether it is true or not absurd. It is a category error and should not be asked. You might as well ask whether Schubert's string quintet in C major Deutsch number 956 likes broccoli. <laughs> Although religion inhabits all five forms of truth, narrative truth is at its core most obviously in its allegory, parable, and myth. Now, I won't say all five forms of truth now, because we're a little short on time, but he does say, which I think is very relevant to both your points, all five <coughs> forms of truth, then, are exuberantly present in religion, which, if confined in the narrow space inhabited by material truth, decays into fundamentalism. There are paradoxes and shadow meanings in all of this, especially in narrative truth and self-denying truth, yet all five are needed for the common purpose of making a future which requires both brain and soul. Actually, he says in a very topical view, um, a little further on, binary de definitions such as this is or is not religious have value only at the extremes at which the identification is trivial in any case. Um, so yeah, um, I think we're, well, we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so maybe if you want to identify, uh, make any comments you have on those questions. Um. Um, I'll sort of start drawing things yeah, us. it's interesting to know where David would be on the cyber community. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think he, I, I'm, I'm so uninterested in that whole sort of cyber computer thing that David, I don't think we ever talked about that. I, I can't remember, I'm sure will correct me. I can't remember a single scintilla of enthusiasm <laughs> on his part for, some, for connectivity at that kind of level of virtualized globality. I just can't remember it. It, pro it may have existed, I, I, just you asking me um, means I can't kind of get there, which mm -hmm. makes me feel maybe, maybe he wasn't there. I, I don't know, it reminds me of what kids do when they're writing out their address, you know, they, there's the name of the, the house, and then the street, and then the community, and then the town, and the country, and then usually ends up with universe. I mean, I think David was pretty clearly focused on the first two or three lines of the address. And a lot of the sort of story about globalization that struck him as, I think, a dangerous abstraction rather than a really helpful way of creating a community. But, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I don't know the answer to your question on that one. In terms well, of <laughs> I mean, it, David's entry to commun it's community... It's like sitting next to someone who can open the Bible. Yeah. And <laughs> tell you, you I've been in training for this event. I know. <laughs> the last know. three <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> um, there aren't many people I can show off about going away around the dictionary in front of. For about tipping points. Um, uh, it is it's fun speculating about tipping points as well as being a really important area of academic inquiry. Um, if you're interested in tipping points in the single field about energy, climate change, transitioning to a different kind of energy, a non-burning energy economy, I don't know if you know the work of Jeremy Leggett, 
um, but he's a solo entrepreneur and he produces a monthly newsletter. If anyone really is interested about the race, because that is how I sort of tend to see it as well, it's a really critical race. He produces a monthly newsletter where he tracks two things, what is happening to accelerate the demise of the fossil fuel industries and what is happening to accelerate the growth of solar in general. And every month you just get this, okay, what happened in the race in June? And it's sort of brilliant because it's just a little snapshot and he's a bit biased and so more good stuff is happening than bad stuff, but then that's, that's okay. Um, and I like this point about the, our, our need to make things less black and white than we're tempted to. I mean, to be honest, I really struggle with this. I have to be honest, I'm absolutely hopeless at it in my own advocacy because I just tend always to go to an excessively definitive place because it makes me feel more confident in what I'm saying. So I'm crap at nuance. Um, and actually, this is my anecdote, funny enough, because Dave wasn't that good at it either in some times. I mean, he got pretty bloody assertive about mm. some of his ideas and what he, what he felt was really important. This is going way back. Okay, so one of the earliest policies that the, Green, the Ecology Party to start with, and then as it became the Green Party later on, um, brought forward, which is amazing when you think about it now, is something called the Universal Basic Income, or Citizen Income, as we called it in the 1970s, because that's when the idea was being first advanced in the Green Party. And there was a guy called Clive Lord, who was one of the founders of the uh, not the founder, but one of the very earliest members of the Ecology Party, People Party, as it was called then, who was this, uh, at the time we thought, was this mad, crazy zealot for universal basic income. And he picked it up, all sorts of different ideas, where it came from and so on. And to start with, David was quite sceptical about the universal basic income, because he was a proper economist as well as anything else. He really tested economic ideas, and if you, if you didn't get that right, that wasn't too good. And he and Clive used to sort of fall out about the universal basic income. Anyway, in the end, <coughs> um, we put the universal basic income in the 1979 general election manifesto, which was um, a really good, because David, having worked his way through it with these endless arguments with Clive Lord and others, felt, that's great. That's fantastic. We're going to go for that. The first party conference afterwards, and I can remember, I can remember this right now, was in Malvern, in the great, in the public, whatever it is, hall or town hall in Malvern. And <laughs> David was, had become an even greater zealot for the universal basic income than Clive Lord. <laughs> and that's saying something. And he stood up to speak about universal basic income, and he was given three minutes, because that's how conferences work. Okay, you get your allocated slot, three minutes, to talk about the importance. And now that we had it in the manifesto, now we've got to go out and we'll win thousands of new members if we really plug the universal basic income. And uh, obviously he exceeded the, the three minutes, <laughs> as you could imagine. And after about six minutes, there was a sort of bit of a stir around the hall. And eventually Clive Lord stood up and said, mm, I think that's probably enough, David. <laughs> so, at which point David did sit down immediately. But once he was off on one, it was very hard to pull him back. It was very hard. And, and afterwards he said, OK, OK. But I, all the time I was looking, there's this slogan on the top of the Malden Town Hall, Levavi meos oculos ad montes, which means I shall lift up my eyes to the mountains. And um, to the, is ad montes? Yes, ad montes, to the mountains. And it, afterwards David said, I just, you know, I suddenly plugged onto that and I wanted to make everybody full of the excitement of the universal basic <laughs> and that's so typical, uh, which meant that he needed three hours, <laughs> rather than three minutes. We all have a few of those experiences. Well, yeah. Of uh, the we, time ones. Yeah, well, <laughs> Jonathan and I were just discussing that both Jonathan's foreword and Rob Hopkins' foreword to the paperback um, relate to <laughs> examples of attempting to get David to stop um, at the limited time. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to echo the Jeremy Leggett thing as well. I, I'm also a subscriber to this, this mm. monthly update. Um, and it is, yeah, it definitely informs the optimism. It mm. definitely, as you say, errs on the optimism. It does. Um, but it's, it's really nice to receive. I mean, because he's someone who goes around hobnobbing with, you know, Al Gore and the heads of big companies and all this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, giving some, and doing amazing work at that level, which is far, far removed from my level. Um, and... Uh, yeah, 
I don't have a particular anecdote that particularly springs to mind, but maybe, um, I mean, my, just the general, utterly transformative part, <laughs> actually the generally transformative um, effect that David had on my life, I, I met him 10 years ago, um, and it was at a time where I was trying to figure out how to reorient my life to deal with <coughs> some of these issues. I mean, I'd, I'd been sort of working in a learning centre for marginalised groups and sort of helping drug misusers and young asylum seekers and people with mental health problems to sort of reintegrate with society, but then in my spare time realising that society itself seemed to be charging off a cliff and feeling like maybe I wanted to engage with that, but how? Um, and I met David at Schumacher College, um, he was teaching on a course there called Life After Oil, and uh, it was incredible for me because we, we quickly became firm friends and started working together and editing each other's work, and the joy of, you know, up till then I'd really been sort of researching and reading stuff in my own, in my room, not really having any peer group around this. I mean, David, it would be, you know, oh, I read this amazing article by such and such. Oh, I'll bring them up, we'll have coffee, you know. And it was just this incredible gift for someone who'd been so involved with the movement for so many years. Mm. Um, and he had one condition on us working together, um, which he was absolutely adamant about, which was that um, he didn't want things to get too stuffy. And so, uh, ever a fan of the, the informal, he said, we absolutely must go for a drink at the pub once a week with no agenda. And that was terribly important. He told me this story about how apparently in Japan, um, when they have a huge decision to make about the takeover of the company or something, uh, they'll sit down around the board table and they'll all agree, but they won't finalise the decision then. And then they'll all go out and get blind drunk together, and if it still seems like a good idea, <laughs> then they'll finalise it in the morning. Um, and David was a huge, huge fan of the, the critical importance of pubs. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think um, I'd like to give David the last word. It seems, seems sort of only appropriate. Um, and one of the... One of the things that really horrified David um, was the, the, the quality of debate in our culture and in politics and in general. The fact that, um, I think he says something like, the, the, the art of, of logic is in very poor health in our, in our culture. And so one of, the, um, one of the iterations of this book was a, was a dictionary of environmental manners. Um, and uh, Rob tells the story of talking to him about, David, is anyone going to know what that means or what one might possibly do with it? Um, but one of the threads that runs through Lean Logic is um, his summation of various fallacies in thinking that are sort of unreasonably influential in, uh, in modern dialogue. Um, so I'd like to end with a couple of his brief entries on these fallacies. Um, and one is his entry on distraction. And he says, distraction. Diverting attention from, from the argument. Consider the proposition that two and two makes four. Distraction might urge, for instance, that the idea is old-fashioned, that the time has come to move on from traditional thinking on the matter, or that it's, it's too technical for the public to understand. It could take the form of an ingratiating assurance that the only thing that matters naturally is the well-being and happiness of everyone concerned. Distraction might urge that it's perfectly okay nowadays to think that two plus two makes five, or that even thinking about it means an unforgivable neglect of the far more important proposition that 3 plus 4 makes 7. You might be invited to take note that there is money to be made by taking a different view of the matter, or that we have to move on from the notion if we are to be competitive, or, or that the proposition is a bit rich coming from someone with a private life like yours. <laughs> or it could insist with some passion that contrary to the view that 2 plus 2 makes 4, we must take our place at the heart of Europe. <laughs> Distraction might add, with hope for finality, that the argument has already been lost. Two plus two is going to make five in the future, whatever we do. Distraction, evidently, has the power and freedom to cause havoc wherever it likes. It is a spoiler, worse than the cheat. The cheat at least recognises the existence of the rules on which argument depends if it is to make any sense, even though he then proceeds to break them, hoping not to be found out. Distraction recognises nothing except conquest. The argument is too serious to have any connection with the orderly rules of honourable play that will be settled by other means. Rules? What rules? It presumes the death of logic. A characteristic form of distraction is to make an assertion which is not true, but which is hard to disagree with. This happens, for instance, with the appeal to the inevitable. The distractor does not argue for or against a proposal. Instead, he simply asserts that it is going to happen anyway, and he may do so in a slightly bored drawl that passes off the sellout as if it were a routine comment on the weather. Don't stand for this. It is one of the ways in which our citizens' right to have a say in deciding for ourselves dwindles into a loss of belief that we can influence anything at all. 
It is designed to induce give up itis, an acceptance that technology and the sweep of history make the decisions. What we are then supposed to do is to surrender, to make sure we are not in the way. And finally, uh, impicatur. The presence of a subtext, another meaning, which makes a statement not quite as simple or as innocent as it looks. Examples. What did you think of the singer? Well, I liked her dress. <laughs> we are tackling the problem of global warming. There is nothing wrong with the statement itself, but it implies that we are on the way to solving the problem. It may also be taken to imply that we can do the job on our own. It sounds reassuring, but it may be telling you that the efforts to tackle global warming are not having much success. The philosopher Paul Grice, who coined the word implicature, points out that implicature is commonplace in conversation and that it comes in many forms. <coughs> Given its potential to mislead, he argued for a code of good conduct in communication, which he called the cooperative principle. Be as informative as required, but no more. Do not say things which you believe to be false or for which you have no evidence. Be relevant. Avoid obscurity and ambiguity. Be brief and orderly. Except when you're not. Lean logic advocates asides, long-windedness if it comes with a story, frank untruths if there is a reasonable chance that the other person can untangle the irony, broken logic if it reflects the difficulty of explaining things which break your heart or are hard to understand. It does not share the modest self-restraint which we find in Psalm 131. I do not exercise myself in great matters which are too high for me. Lean logic finds that when dealing with great matters, it can from time to time be a good thing if there are cracks and faults in the argument for the repair of which help is invited. It is a reminder that a conversation is a cooperative affair, not just a series of beautifully manicured statements. So on that note, I invite you to David's conversation um, on sale at the back of the room. And um, thank you all for coming to be part of this conversation. And we've got about uh, five minutes, I think, five to eight minutes, if you want to continue chatting and chat to us. I think Jonathan's got to run off fairly promptly. Um, but thank you all, it's been an absolute yeah. pleasure.